He is a legend, a part of Ayrshire folklore. Not many people knew him by name, but thousands passed him every day. To many, he was a reassuring presence. You know, I'm thinking, why is he standing there? If he wasn't there, where did he go? Well, some of them don't even want to know the story. You know, they don't want to know, what, but it's just, he's there. He's just a character since I was a wee boy. Um, we would arrive home from school, bundled into the car, taken down to Hills of Hospital to pick my mum up. And there he'd be standing at the gate. And for the world, I never knew his name until just very recently. I didn't know his name was Clive. But I was always a curious bairn, so I asked my dad, I said, what's that man doing? So my dad said, well, just keep an eye on you. So you think to yourself, what's he watching for? So I better be his best behaviour. So you got to the point where it was like, you would expect to see him there. So there was a kind of comfort factor. I don't know whether that's, that makes sense or no, but it's a comfort factor that was always there. And I didn't see him for quite some time. And I left the pits and went to work in the electronics industry with digital. And their factory was at the top of the hill. So I'm driving past, going to work every morning. And there he is, standing at the gates. And you think to yourself, oh, the memory is, well, he's keeping an eye on me. And as this thing goes on and on over the years, and I was there 16 years and saw him day in, day out. Um, and then when I left there, I went to work at BE Systems at Presswick. And he was standing at the back gates to the entrance to the factory. I couldn't believe it. I've been watching these, you know, like all these years and all these different things and different events in my life. And there was Clive. Standing at the side of the road, keep an eye on me. <laughs> it just, it, it just kind of, I don't know. It, it, you always felt as oh, like a kind of reassurance that he's, he's always there, sort of thing. But subconsciously saying to my, to my dad who's passed away, yeah, well he's still keep an eye on me, dad. <laughs> you know, which, yeah, it's really, really nice. He would probably have said something like, why did they mean tragedy? Why would they say tragedy of the man who stood outside the hospital? I was all right, I was quite happy. Why was it a tragedy? If he'd have been able to ask the question, that's probably the question he would have asked. He would have read the story. He would have read that, he would have gone right through it and read every page of that, every letter of that. And he would have probably have pointed to his own picture and said something like, why am I here? Because you could understand him. He didn't speak the words, but you knew what he was saying. I think this is a great picture of them and his sister when they were young. I think it just shows you he was just a normal little wee boy. In 1951, Clive would have been eight years old at the time. What I remember about childhood is that we got along pretty well together. Um, we would sometimes play together. We would chase each other in the garden, um, we'd, we'd spend time um, with painting together or with our crayons, um, probably just like normal children would do. Obviously there were times when it was a little difficult because Clyde couldn't talk, but I just, that was life <laughs> and just got used to it. As you got to know him, you got to know what he was saying. It was, it's like having another you know, another string to your bow kind of thing. You, you, I understand what you're saying to me because we speak, but when you're around somebody so long, you get to understand what they want without them actually telling you. And it's just a, unspoken between the two. That it's, it's a, it's a, a strange feeling, but it's a nice, a nice feeling. If you're one to one, you have the, the time to spend reading somebody, and so he learned to express himself better. I think. I think we just work together. He would show it in strange, wee kind of ways, you know, would be a kind of gesture or even a kind of look. Well, I kind of read into it that he, he kind of knew how you were feeling, but it felt that way. Clive was fascinated by planes very early in his life and loved to watch them. In June of 1944, Clive would have been about 21 months at the time. He's looking up, watching a plane. And that's the first recorded picture that I could find of him 
actually watching a plane, but obviously that was a very early age. And the other one, um, I'm sitting on the ground with him and he's watching a plane. So again, an interest in planes from quite a young age. Yeah, well, the thing is, we've heard so many different story, stories about his childhood. It wasn't really until we had met his sister Stella when she came over that we got the true story. I mean, when we first worked, worked with him, we get told that um, he was a pianist, but he was an accomplished pianist, so we were going to get him a piano, and that he, he had talked, so we were expecting Clive to speak in, with an English accent. We were just waiting for it to come out. Clive had started talking um, when he was about two years old, and then he stopped when the bombs started coming over in World War II, and they thought that that was a trauma from the bombs. And I've since learned that, that that can be a sign of autism. And he did have a good childhood. I mean, there was obviously issues with his dad understanding him and stuff, but I think that was kind of the times then. People have got to kind of understand it was a completely different time. And one of the reasons for family moving to California was that my father had met a speech therapist there on a previous visit uh, who felt he could help Clive. And so that was definitely a motivation for moving into California. The family started a new chapter when Clive's father got a job at Stanford University in California. The family packed up and sold their home. It marked the end of childhood for Clive as he turned 18 just a few days before they travelled. They took a flight from London, and in those days, flights refuelled at Presswick Airport in Scotland. This is where Clive's adult life began, quite different from what the family had planned. My mum was at the airport seeing her sister and family be back to Canada. So I don't think they'd have been in the same flight, but I think they were in the, they were in the airport at the same time, because my sister and I grew up with this. My mum always saying to us, I wonder what happened to, happen to that young lad who they had, my mum had seen. Um, he had taken a, a turn, as she put it, a wee turn or a wee fit at Placebook Airport, and the doctors had to be called, and he had to be restrained, and he, wasn't, he didn't look that well when he, when he, when he left. But that was a, the day that Clive was admitted to Elsa Hospital. When my parents saw what happened at Presswick Airport, and that was violence, that was extreme violence, they were grown men to hold Clive down. And they had to heavily sedate him uh, to the point where the doctor was actually afraid he'd killed him. And it was in that environment that my parents were forced to make the decision that they could no longer cope, realised they could no longer cope, and they had to commit Clive to an institution, and it was something they'd been trying to avoid for years. And it was far from any desire to abandon him. They're, trying, they're just fragile human beings as well, uh, trying to do their best. Why did my parents move on to the United States? Well, at that point, we were in the process of moving. <clears throat> All our possessions were on their way to California. Um, my father's job, taking on a job in California, pretty well committed. It must have been dreadful for them waking up in, in Ilsa Hospital. I mean, hours before he'd been going to start a new life with his mum, dad and sister, young sister, and then he blanked out and when he woke up, he was in a completely different setting. He knew nobody, he knew nothing round about him. I think it would have had a big impact on him. I mean, I think his autism might have protected him in a lot of senses where he was able to actually kind of retreat into himself a bit. And obviously institutions then were completely different, you know, to what they are now. Ailsa Hospital was a few miles from Presswick Airport. Clive was admitted there three days after his 18th birthday. In 1970, Robert Kennedy started nursing there at the age of 17 and remembers Clive, who would have been 28 years old at the time. Clive had the run of the hospital and you would find them pop him up everywhere and he would always have his fingers at his head and he would hum, made small humming noises 
kind of, mm -hmm. that was what it was like. Uh, I don't know if you've found anyone that's uh, found Clive Hammond to be uh, aggressive. I don't think you would. His bag was collecting uh, cards, wee knickknacks. The family did keep in touch with Clive after we moved to the United States by regularly sending him cards and postcards on a more or less monthly basis. First, my mother picked up on that, and then after she died, I did. When she and I first went back to visit Clive, he appeared with bundles of those postcards in both hands. Sharif Bakuth first met Clive when he was working as a nursing assistant at Elsa Hospital. Clive would have been 43 years old at the time. Basically, what I, what I know about Clive was, he was a kind of very, he kept himself to himself. He didn't bother him, he wasn't a, a violent person in any way. And he had his daily kind of rituals. He had a box and he would carry cards, postcards, birthday cards, just cards people would give him. There was no, his personal cards. Because a couple of times, most of the patients at that time didn't really bother. They, they wouldn't interfere with him. He just had his wee, own wee bubble that he kind of lived in. But these, these cards were basically his prized possession. It's as if this was all that he, that he owned and took care of. So I looked through it one day and he knew that that box had been touched. When he came back, you could tell his reaction. He changed because he was agitated in a way. And he used to kind of go about and he would be frantic because he knew somebody touched his box of cards. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite a... A kind of fascinating character that way, that's why he's one of the ones that stuck in my head. He was known to, was known to come and stand here, this, is, this was his bit here, just where they stood and watched all the traffic, an ambulance coming in, where they watched all the traffic get up and down. He was, he was the, the first one that I saw in the morning when he commenced, and a lot of other people would see him as well. And he stood there at, at, all through the day, sometimes through the day he would come here as well. Clive first came into my life um, when I started working at Osa Hospital. Um, must be about, maybe 18, 20 years ago. Um, he came up around about the offices, which he had been doing for years before I started there. He would meet me at the front gate. As I turned into my work, Clive was standing. Somebody said to roll down the window and shout, go and get a jacket because it was pouring a rain or it was cold and he was out there with just a shirt and a jumper on. And when I first started at Osa Hospital, it was, he was in a, a cubicle. It was with the, it wasn't, he had, didn't have a room to himself, it was in, he was in a kind of dormitory with curtains drawn between the beds, which I found really hard to take. I'll tell you a wee bit about what life was like at that time as well. One bath a week. One change of underwear a week. I did, but that's how things were in those days. I wasn't along there before he, went, he did get a room on his own. If you look at any other area of clinical care, it's my belief that uh, psychiatry in particular, we've been able to take our experiences from the past. So patients and service users like Clive, whose experiences were steeped in older practices, we've always been modernising, but I think we've come further in the last 20 to 25 years than any other phase in the 20th and 21st century in psychiatry. That must be where he stood at the gates. That was the gates there. And then he would come over to the main bit. But that he had the whole, he walked around the whole of that. He never ever ventured as far down as here. It was funny that. You know, he was comfortable with that, but he wasn't maybe comfortable going outside unless he had somebody with him. Even in the winter time, I mean, he wasn't fussy whether it was raining or no. It was out in all sorts of weather. And it was all done in between his around his television schedule as well. So when people say, oh, he stood at the gates for 52 years, it sounds like he stayed there the whole time. No, he did stay, no. He had, he had his own uh, routines. He had routines. And um, if there was a Bonanza programme on that interrupted him coming up to see me in the afternoon, the Bonanza programme would always come first. Um, it was never, never... The routines were, were to suit Clive, which was rightly so. But I always felt that there was something with Clive. Um, and then the more I got to know the story, I began to think, 
This is the young lad that my mum talked about um, at Presbyk Airport. And a sister and I grew up with uh, my mum saying, you know, I wonder what ever happened to that young lad who took ill in the airport. And it was once it got to piece together, I thought, this is the boy, this is this young lad that my mum talked about. Unfortunately, I couldn't, she'd passed away by the time I went to, Hill, to work at Hills Hospital. Uh, so she never, never got to, to know that I'd found him, but I'm sure that she talked so much about him that I'm sure if she could have found out and had known what had happened to him, that his parents went on to America without him, I'm sure Clive would have been part of your family. And um, at the end of the day, that's just what he became to me. Uh, my mum was not there by that time, but I'm, I'm sure, kind of 100% certain, but I'm sure that, that that young lad was Clive Hammond. He loved all his wee die car, he cast metal cars and buses that he would dismantle. Do you like twisting the legs off them? Mm. Where do you go carry on with it? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm. But I just normally find them about the floor. <laughs> like a donkey leg here and giraffe leg there. But so I don't actually know the reason behind it, but it does amuse them. I mean the cars and the the trains that he takes to bits and he picks the paint off it, it's like he's taking it back to the, the bare, you know, the bare backs of the, the toy, but with the animals, I don't really know. I don't know, it's, it's quite sick in a sense, isn't it? You know, one of the big frames with, like, the different photo spaces, so we had kind of come up with the idea that we would take lots of really up-close shots of his, his toys, so when I had said to him to line them up, but none of the animals could stand up because they had no legs, I'm like, Clyde, your animals can't stand up, mm -hmm. and he just laughed constantly, so... <laughs> He obviously finds there's some sort of humour in it, but apart from that, I don't really know. Yeah, maybe like... Mm. Like, oh, do you think it's funny you take the animal's legs off your toys? Mm. Do you think it's funny? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Stones. I know, it's quite amazing. I still would love to find out what it was that he looked at so intently for hours and hours. And I asked him, I was like, you know, is it the sparkles in it or is it... But obviously, I never found the bottom of that question. But it is fascinating. I'd love to have found out the answer and how his brain worked, even just for a minute. Get into his own wee world and tuning out and it did kind of radiate off him. Very intelligent man, I mean as far as I'm concerned he's a very intelligent man. Um, because somebody who couldn't speak and who'd been in an institution all those years that could read and write the way he did and could express himself the way he did, I think that's remarkable. I've never met him, I've lost it in films quite as much as you. I don't even know where your hands are. I'm going to be absolutely shocked if this isn't on today, Clive, and once again, it's not my fault if the weather's bad. I can't make them come out with their stalls. Right, just watch your head on the way out, honey. I mean, whether it be sparkly things, beads and... They made sense to him and it was his world. I mean, if you think about it, for all those years being in the institution, and that was all he had to do, was to collect things, to hold on to them. That was his world. Clive really liked his newspapers. When I, I when come in in the morning, I always brought a newspaper with me, um, the Daily Mail, and the first thing that Clive did was the hand was out and took the paper off me, and it was read from front to back in a very, very quick 
uh, reading, but whether he read it all or whether um, he was just skimming through it, I don't know. Then he would get to my crosswords. Just run his finger down the clues, that quickly. And then they would get scanned as well, right down. Things that, that would catch, and not just Clive, but anyone with uh, that spectrum of, of autism, there would be certain sequences they, they tend to work in very set sort of sequence. That's the way they perceive their environment or the world. And there's no doubt in my mind, yes, that Clive w was was probably looking for sequences that, that would mean something to him. He loved to stand in the corner of the garden at our home in Reigate and watch the traffic go by. And one day, in fact, he had been out all morning. Um, he came in for lunch, wanted a piece of paper, and he proceeded to write down a list of registration numbers. And there probably were around a hundred of them on that list. Obviously he had some phenomenal capabilities and he did love to watch the traffic. That, that's a way to perceive the environment. And I think that's what Clive, there's no doubt that Clive was doing something when he was standing watching the cars. Like every six car, every tenth car, or a car with such and such a number plate on, because at times it would become quite animated and not distressed, just animated, right? And if you take a fly, there's a Boeing 747, and he'd be out there and he'd be looking at it. So these things meant something to him. After 52 years in hospital, it was unclear how Clive, now 70, would react to leaving Elsa. It took five years to transition Clive into his own home. The, the, the house was identified and Clive actually believed and understood what it was. This is your home, Clive. But we kept waiting in the overnight stay. It was really cold winter and we kept getting stuck in the traffic going up and down and I had said to Clive, see when I come back from annual leave, you're moving into this house. That's ridiculous, we're spending hours in the traffic. Mm -hmm. So the Emma was saying the same thing. And then I was off for a fortnight, came back on the 11th of March. <coughs> it was me that was working with Clive. Um, and uh, on the, another coincidence, on the 11th of March, Marjorie the phone me at night. She says, you'll never guess what's just happened. And I said, is he staying? She says, he come through and he's in his pyjamas. We're staying the night. I says, Marjorie, this is my mum's birthday. It's 11th of March, my mum's birthday. And then obviously he didn't have any of his treasures or anything with him. Some that he'd accumulated maybe been out with us, but he didn't have like his proper ones. We'll see what happens. Got up in the morning, wrote Elsa, I phoned Anne Marie to come and help me. And we got to the door and he, he had arranged where to put his bags. So he had been, for that fortnight I'd been off, he'd been planning what treasures he wanted to take and what ones to discard. And I, the, the man could run. So while I was talking to the nurses, trying to um, <laughs> trying to arrange medication for him because it happened so quickly, Anne Marie was trying to help him, and then one of the uh, nursing auxiliaries gave her a trolley, and she was running up the corridor behind him with the trolley, and he's throwing all these bags in because he'd put them in all different places. Turned round, ran back to my car with Anne Marie chasing him with the trolley, throwing it all in. By that time, I'd got his meds. I don't even know if it was three minutes it took him. And he jumped in the car, and I looked in my rear view mirror, and he was laughing absolutely just barely laughing. So he'd had it all planned all along. So all that money was spent and all the planning days and all the arranging and all of us suppose, supposedly clever people that know what we're doing, actually what we should have done is just said, Clive, <laughs> when would you like to move in? Because he had it all planned out in his head, so. And that was him. The house was, to me, somebody sat that house down in Moncton and said, this is for Clive. You could sit it's in, outside the front door and look at the airport, all the flights going out and in. Although that had happened to him at the airport, it didn't seem to uh, stop that, that his love of planes in any way. And he spent many a happy day sitting outside in his wee house. But I, I remember when he first moved in and there'd be the fighter jets coming and he would run, <laughs> you know, as fast as he could to see them. I think he got a bit more relaxed about it. It was when he chose to, to see them. If it was a fighter jet, then he would definitely make the effort for it. 
but and if it was one of those huge big cargo planes or you know the the big army ones, he loved to see them coming in, and he would stand and watch them, and he'd like to get you know when we were going for the shopping and then we'd drive by the airport and they would look in to see what was sitting. It was a rare find from that house. That's the Royal Air Force. Like a wee flower opening up, just watching all the different things, he suddenly realised that the television didn't go off at 8 o'clock at night, he didn't have to go to bed by 9. So you can sit and sleep properly. There you go. See? Looking for you. You want a cup of tea, Clive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> that was another thing, figuring out the shops didn't only open between 10 and 12. You know, you could go to if you wanted to. Same with the television, but not after the 8 o'clock. So as he kind of learned, it's just, I don't know, I guess he didn't have to protect his stuff or anything anymore. So the camera he got, it, it just it radiated out of him to, to everybody he touched. Everybody felt calm, peaceful, serenity. Brilliant talent. The house was so stress free. You know, there was no, it was a calm, calm, peaceful home. Very much what I was different from what I was led to believe when I first met Clive, this angry man. This was a, a house that you went to and it was just like a stress-free environment. The happiness that was in the home and the love that was in the home as well. Because all the carers did love Clive and they all did their best, their best for him. Um, and you could sense, you could sense that when you went in. I used to look forward to it. I, I really did. It was a, a place of calm and... I don't, I did look forward to it, but I don't think I appreciated how much I looked forward to it. And him, he, he just kind of used a, a relaxed, calming influence. That even, you know, if you're having a shitty time and, you know, you're getting into life struggles and you would go in and, you know, as a rule, they always say, leave your stuff at the front door and you go in, but you kind of had to. It just happened naturally with him. So I missed that. It was a bit like a council that he didn't have to speak, it, speak to. <laughs> that sounds strange. But it felt like it just touched everybody that... Which is lovely, because I, I think that's the most amazing thing for me for Clive. It could so easily have gone... If somebody locked me up for 52 years, I, I would not come out. Like I don't think I'd come out at all. Um, but he must have had such inner strength, because all that calmness... <clears throat> He could have been very angry, and he wasn't. I knew this was difficult. But it would have been sadder if he hadn't gone to his house at all. So at least he had some good time. Clive passed away on Valentine's Day with Marjorie and Margaret by his side. And I miss him, even though it's only two or three weeks since he died. Um, we were scattered his ashes down Prestwick Beach. Clive's memory lives on as part of Ayrshire folklore through the many lives that he touched. Around 2,000 people passed him daily and some passed him their entire working lives. When he passed away during filming, those closest to him decided that the film should be part of his legacy. An article was published in a local newspaper and it went viral. People nationwide came forward with their memories of Clive. Bus drivers who would give Clive a wave to retired nurses and commuters who missed his reassuring presence at the roadside, 
all sad at his passing and moved by his story. As I said, that's my story was that he was looking after me, keeping an eye on me. <laughs> because he's a, he's a character. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a bit kind of like the what, folklore, if you want to call it that. You know, it's part of the issue of folklore. So I think the, the sort of folklore is because he was there for so long and people, the man that I had met, had, had a whole career from apprenticeship to retirement and it, Clive was a constant that was there. But for me, if he, if, if he has even called the legend, it's because of his resili resilience and his ability to come out and still enjoy the world. And I can't even, and I do think about it sometimes, what it must have been like when he went in at 18 to come out and just cope. That's amazing, because everything will have changed. So, yeah, that's, that makes him very special, I think. <laughs>